Okay, so hello everybody and uh, third day of the conference. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Joe Dupnik, uh, which will who will talk uh, about the complete uh, server to assist charities. So, all right. Okay, good morning survivors and all this kind of stuff. If the echo becomes too bad, I will simply move this mic far away. Well, if I do that, I hear this terrible echo. Turn down the volume. Is this much better? All right. That should be fine. Um, this is a project which is using open source to build a rather complete server. In the end, it looks very much like Novell's OES server, but completely open source, OpenSUSE 11.4. And it was done for a reason, to support charities and non-government organizations. And the, uh, there's a bit of a story to this thing. So I'll give you a little bit of philosophy first on this thing. And, and the idea was for us as a small company uh, doing work to support charities, we need to have things that would be easily uh, used by them and uh, managed by them in terms of creating users and so on, but the internals would be managed by, by the Ingo Tech Group, myself and my colleague, uh, for things. Anyway, it's a nonprofit organization that does things, and when we make money, we put it back into the organization to help other people. So I'm going to be talking about three different server systems here, and primarily on the first one we put together, just to give you an idea how these things go. I wanted to get the full uh, server. I needed to train people in the field about how this thing works and get volunteers to help with the dailies and, and, and so on. And then use that same system and repeat it for different applications for different uh, groups of people. And you can do the same thing. So we started off uh, with OpenSUSE uh, for reasons that were monetary. Uh, was the charities have almost no money, and so buying a commercial product was not possible for them. Yet they wanted everything, so that was the problem. And I uh, used 11.4 uh, as a good solid base for doing these things. Uh, they wanted email, they wanted file serving, they wanted web servers, uh, they wanted a whole bunch of other apps, and they wanted backups. And there's no money for tape drive. So the question is how to do this thing. So as I've described it locally, it's an IT shop in a box, the whole thing for them. And as I mentioned at the bottom line, it looks a lot like the commercial uh, OES 11 product by the time we get finished. So when we do these things, it's a problem for us as designers as to how to choose and then combine and test. Uh, so I had some philosophies here that you can take to heart. I wanted to use as much existing components as possible so that I was not creative. That means that someone coming along behind me can then reproduce what's going on as soon as these people get finished talking in the back <laughs> on things. So invent as little as possible so somebody else can reproduce things. And document things as much as we can. It's not a pleasant thing to do, but we have to. And I call them hit by a bus one, hit by a bus number two. Uh, and then get rid of the administration, push it off on the locals so my phone doesn't ring, oh, I have a new user kind of thing. And then because this is exposed in the field and amateurs are running it, uh, have layered security throughout this thing. So the system will stand up to the internet quite nicely, and it has. And then. I'm a, I'm a space physics person in reality, and so I try to design things right the first time by spending my time in advance rather than in hacking things in, in the situation. So there's all, always hard parts in these things and easy parts. Um, the hard part was to figure out what the heck to combine to make the system. They had general ideas but no specifics. So I had to try many components and see what was effective and what was not, learn my way into the system. And uh, when we do this, it's an interesting problem that repeats itself many times. We have a complicated environment. We don't know what will work. We have to explore a little bit here, maybe retreat, and a little bit there, and we keep exploring. And it becomes a tree. 
you can see, you know, trying different pathways and things. And that very quickly gets out of hand uh, because there's so many branches. And so you have to develop a skill as to which, choosing which branch to follow and, and so forth. Uh, and I had to do a proper LDAP directory uh, to make this thing work to hold user credentials, which was not much fun. Uh, very simple interface for users. When these, these local managers are working on things, I'll show you the, uh, a problem uh, to do this stuff. And it has to be uh, very obvious and so on. And be thorough and persistent and watch the assumptions. <clears throat> so when I got finished with this, uh, this was the original edition of things, I had a dispatch screen. So users would say, well, I don't know what's out there. And they just simply go to one web page and then the screen shows up. <clears throat> now, you can't really read all this from here, but there are two boxes, one for users, one for uh, administrators, and a whole bunch of text on the side. And the users will go, oh, I'd like to run eGroupware, which is a portal-like product, or something else, change password, and so on. So they have one place where they can find directions, rather than a very pretty web page. And then administrators, which uh, have a, a box below it. It requires administrator's access. I check credentials and then get in and manipulate the system a bit. So that was the design philosophy on that. So um, in, in doing these things, there are a lot of components that come into play. And so I drew a picture of some of them and there's an above and below the line. Above the line is what users see in red and below the line in blue are what managers have to worry about. We have things like uh, Samba at the top uh, with changing passwords, uh, IMAP4 for email system, uh, Postfix is in there with, with filtering and CLAM antivirus and so on, uh, a web-based Sieve program for rules, uh, eGroupware, uh, which is from Germany, uh, open source, uh, password uh, changing, uh, password email web, serv web self-service. In other words, users change their own passwords, not by calling me, but they go to a web page. And WebDAV is running, uh, I've got mailman list server in there, and, and help facility, oh, what do I do? And that's all on the top, and below the line are things like OpenLDAP, Apache Studio to look at it, SSH, RT help system, uh, ticket system, and all the controls in MySQL, and oh goodness knows, it goes on and on and on this way. It gives you some idea of the things that have to fit together. For many American audiences, uh, they are unfamiliar with uh, portals as they may exist today. Uh, and so it's an old subject. eGroupware is, is a German outfit that produces a commercial and an open source version of the same product. And what it is is a screen, as you can barely see from here, with a lot of pretty icons across the top. Each one's a different function, email, file serving, um, and so on. It goes, it's a very long list, and I'm just checking email on here. My users have discovered this is very handy because it can go to one place and click and get service. And again, the idea is simplicity. And if we look at the list of what goes on in this thing, it's really quite amazing. Uh, email, <clears throat> it's an IMAP for agent, document management system, calendaring, web dev, address books, mobile sync, bookmarks, chat, timesheets, wiki, blah, blah, blah. It really goes on. It's really quite amazing stuff to make it go. Uh, LDAP. <clears throat> uh, as you probably know, when you get an open LDAP directory, you get a database and they say, oh, well, would you like to add something to the database? Yes, I would, but what would you like? You can't say I'd like to add a user because they have no idea what that is. So you then have to deal with schema and attributes and access control lists all on your own and to design this thing. Now, I don't like doing that kind of stuff, but I did it in this case. So we have to construct by hand from parts. I made it look like OES uh, with eDirectory. To, to make these things go. Uh, we have a lot of third-party applications, and in the open source community, uh, there are many products that use MySQL to store credentials. And we all know that SQL injection attacks will steal everything, it's hard to prevent. So we put them into LDAP, and LDAP doesn't allow the user input from the outside world to create verbs that influence the database. MySQL does. So LDAP's really quite quite good in these things. 
but the concept of user and group varies from application to application. Groups in particular in, in LDAP things are all over the map. So we have to decide what is the working system and construct the database to support it and then reconfigure the applications to work with that way. I tried to use everything I could with POSIX compatibility, Samba support. And when we do these things with Samba, there are two passwords that get involved with NT. And then we have an LDAP based password for access. It means that we have three passwords and we have to keep them synchronized or there's chaos. So I had to deal with that problem. Uh, if one goes into the, the Linux system and looks at the individual components for managing passwords, it's awful, truly awful. And there was just no way that that was going to survive. So I, I put tools in place that allows me to solve the problem, which I'll show here in a second. So user provisioning is the general subject, creating users and then assigning properties and, and manipulating them is the piece here. And that was going to be very difficult because of the way individual components were scattered and they didn't recognize each other. So I went back to a very old program called WebMin. It's a bunch of Perl scripts. It's been around for eons and took a subset of it and then rewrote much of the code to get a goal, which was a screen, which in the blue portion here you can barely read, that lists usernames and it's scrollable. So you can go down, just scroll down, pick a user and expand, click on their name and expand their details. But I needed to be web-based because my clients have no shell access at all. Everything is, is across the net. Web-based, menu organized for them, and it was role restricted so that a high level manager sees more capabilities than a low level manager to do things. And I needed to be able to create users and modify them and so on, but a batch facility and have everything take place. Now, there's a bit of a story here uh, to do it. Once I went in and chose a user, which I've done in my case here, there's a detail screen, which even me standing right here can't read it. <laughs> But there's a top panel that has the name, first name, last name, password, home directory, and, and attributes of this kind. And then a bunch of choices for groups in, in the middle of things. And the idea was to fill in the blanks and hit the, the OK button and everything happens. So I went further than that. This was the first attempt at this. You can see there are a lot of boxes on the screen. And through time, I've reduced it to a simpler form which asks four questions to create a user. First name, last name, password, and user ID. <clears throat> so what's your username on things? So your personal name and your user ID and your password. And once you've filled in those four items, you hit the OK button at the bottom, and everything in the system is created for you. So it's a zero-day start. The system goes through, gets the home directory set up, it pre-populates that, it makes certain everything is okay in LDAP. The whole nine yards takes place. And so we just do that. Now, once I've created a user, I can come back in the same system and take a look and see what their credentials are. Anything I change on the screen becomes the new value. I click OK and it goes into the system. So it's a true what you see is what you get kind of system. So you want to change your UID number, your, you, you know, instead of 602, it's 605. Be fine, go ahead. If there's, if there's no problem, the system will do it. So it becomes very easy to manage. Now I showed this, story time, to some of my colleagues in Novell. And uh, because the systems there are a little more elaborate, I said, this is very easy to use. Look what we have to go through with the normal stuff from the company. And wouldn't it be nice if we had a layer on top of the complicated to simplify things, which is what this is. And they said, oh, my goodness. <clears throat> so this has been fed around. The, this picture has been fed around the company all over the place the, as, a, as a goal for things. Um, when I uh, get uh, everything organized, I go, into open L, I go into open LDAP with typically Apache Studio, a very good program to look at LDAP directories just to see what I put in there. And it's just impressive the number of attributes and values and so on that one gets involved in, in making these things happen. 
Um, and that's a very handy tool to do. You're supposed to be impressed. Uh, LDAP directory stuff, if you have played with it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, then you begin to see there's uh, uh, two sides of the equation, the stuff above the line, which is webmen and password changers, and then below the line are all kinds of uh, components, the PAM stack, uh, various password changing things for SMB and LDAP. Uh, there's the, uh, I use Apache Studio as an editor, uh, the search routines, and there's open LDAP, and there's a whole bunch of third-party stuff that comes in along the sides. Quite a few components to make all this thing go. And as I commented, the, the notions of users and groups and similar are abstract. We have to invent them ourselves. So the best thing to do if you're starting this game is to go to some place that has them, use that, maybe it's Windows, maybe it's eDirectory, and use that as a starting point for knowing what has to go into the, the thing. Uh, to make it go through. Now, passwords is the next thing. Because there are three passwords, each encrypted differently, and users have to be able to change their passwords, I decided the best approach was to put up a password changing web page. And there are two panels on here. The left is for users, the right is for administrators. That allows, it's a PHP program, that allows users to identify themselves, who are, who am I, and here's my new password, and optionally, here's my new email address. Design here, once you've identified yourself, if you don't want to add, change your password, don't put anything in the new password box. If you don't want to change your email, don't put anything in the email box. And it says in fine print that if you don't fill in anything, nothing changes. So it's a quick way of checking if everything works. So as a design philosophy, it's very straightforward to see if things work and, and you're not clearing things out just because it's empty. The administrator is the person who has to say, oh, well, you've really forgotten your password, so well, I'll just force in a new value. So it asks the questions about who the administrator is first as, as well. More big pictures. Email is always great fun. And uh, with POSIX email, it's, it's, it's quite a game that can be played. On the top here, I've got things like uh, remote access, a, a person's in the field, they are in Bosnia or someplace, and they wish to send email securely. So I need a, an encrypted channel between them and the server, and the email that they want is going to go out somewhere else. So I have an encrypted channel to the server, so that's, that's a degree of protection. And then the server relays it out. And when we do this, I think as most people here probably know, we have credentials to say who are you to make certain that you're allowed to relay through the server authenticated only. So I have that, uh, the main port 25, uh, and the C port is the third one over, and then I'm at poor connections coming in from the outside. They all involve either mail or credentials. Mail's in red, credentials are in green. And they hit postfix, wonderful stuff. Postfix doesn't know how to deal with credentials very well, so I give it to Dovecot, the IMAP poor agent, that does know how to handle credentials, and that's what the green boxes are below. And it hits the PAM stack and goes off to ETC files, like ETC shadow and so on, or it goes off to the LDAP material to figure out if you're in a directory. Either one, wherever you live, it finds you. On the right side in red is the Dovecot delivery agent, people, love creating subdirectories in their email list. They have a, a directory, and then they have a sub, then they have more subs, you know how people are. And so to make that happen, I use the mailder format for storing things, because mbox doesn't allow subdirectories. Um, and so the user's inbox is there, and of course Dovecot serves IMAP port connections to the world. So all this thing works actually rather well. Lots of pieces. And the, the email sieve, there's a program called Smart Sieve that's out there, open source, PHP, that allows the rules to go into Dovecot so the email is filtered in the server. And this is just an example of some of the rules I have sitting on my thing. And that's user accessible. Um, well, just some features, uh, Mailder, I think I've mentioned all these things as we've gone through here. Uh, but basically, everything in the system is SSL encoded, so all communications to the outside world, except for things like port 25, are covered by SSL. Um, there's a piece in here that's interesting because at the bottom line, it says prevent outsiders guessing usernames. 
Now, with email, there's a SMTP protocol. Uh, there's a scheme that says you say hello to the server, and, and the guy says, yeah, hi, good morning. And you say, I have mail from, and, and here's where it's going to, and so on. And the bad guys will say it's mail from fake username. And the recipient is two, and they'll start guessing names at your site. And the SMTP protocol says the server must respond with, at that point, user has been found or user has not been found. And if it says found, then you go on and say, here's some data and here's a subject line and body. But if it's not found, then it's, you can't proceed any further. So what the bad guys do is they start guessing names and they get to the point where the, the found, not found response. So they discover every username in your system. And once they discover something that works, they don't, they, they say, fine, that's the end of that, I'm not gonna send any mail. So there's no mail that goes through, but they've, they've got all the usernames in your system. So the way I get around this is I say, SMTP always will report users as presence. And then it lets Postfix decide if there's a delivery to a user and if not, there's no such user, I put it into a special bin. I call it not a user, a dummy user. So the mail system always absorbs, always absorbs. It never rejects. There's no backscatter and there's no guessing. So I watch the logs from the bad guys trying this guessing game and they very quickly get bored. <laughs> there's no information, they go elsewhere on these things. And then I go into the not a user, this fake user, and I, I look at the accumulated debris, 99 point something percent is junk, and get rid of the bad stuff and pick up the maladdress, the, the typos, and send them on to the real user. That's a very effective technique of handling things. So people don't know who's in my system. Samba, <clears throat> oh boy, I don't like Windows programming, uh, Windows networking at all. Uh, many years ago, uh, many years ago, uh, at and came to me and said, would I write the code that supports uh, DOS machines of the day to do windows styled networking, SMB networking. So I wrote the code that goes to the system five, makes all that happen. And uh, that was nice, uh, good things, but I don't like it myself. But users wanted something. So I set up Samba uh, to, to do everything in a very standard fashion. I did not want to create a domain controller relationship between the users and the server. When you create the domain controller relationship, you, you are attached as a client to that domain controller. It owns you. I wanted complete independence. So I, I backed off and just let the file transfer go without all the domain stuff and these things. Now as it turns out, and through time, users decided not to do that. Times change. People think, oh, I have a big hard drive. Why should I put things on a server? Well, because we can back it up. Oh, <clears throat> they don't think that way. They think of local storage. So they backed away from the Samba stuff, which is good by my standards. Instead, <clears throat> we have a different problem with file serving. Samba, SMB blocks, uh, CIFS, all those good things uh, are security hazards, I think, as most of us know. So we don't let them off site. We cut it off at the, at the router on the, on, the, on the site perimeter. And so what do people do when they're farther away? And the answer is things like WebDAV, which run over HTTPS, allow access to files in a very natural fashion. And that works very well. So you can be anywhere in the world and still use WebDAV, provided the WebDAV server is, is, is competent. Um, the eGroupware uh, portal uh, provides WebDAV access to its file system. I have other WebDAV things. And that's worked well indeed for people. And so they, they can be anywhere in the world as they typically are. Um, block internet intruders, security again kind of stuff. I, I tend to pay attention to security uh, in Apache, for example. Uh, I will have the restrictions on IP numbers on sensitive things, require passwords that are checked in LDAP and, and so on. And I put all this stuff in the logs. And then I have a log uh, routine called fail to ban open source. Uh, Python, which looks at the logs in real time and decides if bad things are happening, and if so, then uh, we'll create a rule in IP tables that will block that access for a period of time. 
And people ask, well, how long? If they've screwed up several times and they get blocked, how long should they wait? And my answer is always a while. <laughs> I never define how long the, the waiting period is. I say, go get a cup of coffee. It'll be okay after a while, <laughs> and, and so on, uh, for things. I disconnect my SQL from the, the network. The only reason that my SQL is there is to support these things like eGroupware and, and others. And so that's a local operation. So it's disconnected from the internet. So I don't have SQL injection attacks. Uh, I protect access to the open LDAP directory. So again, so there's no internet access to it. SSH, Telnet, FTP, and so on are restricted to the system managers uh, and, and so forth. And so the ordinary users have no shell access at all. And it turns out they don't need it, and they get along quite nicely without it. Pictures, a little more complicated. I mentioned they needed backups. At the time I was doing this, there was a lot of pressure in a short amount of time and no money. So I created two servers. Uh, we, we can see here a master and a slave. And I, I had independent disk drives. There's no SAN, no money. And I used rsync to copy files from A to B periodically, about once an hour. And I did the same thing with the databases to make sure they were, they were the same on both systems. And then I had the ESXi box that I could control the connection to the internet. That's what these two switches are here. <clears throat> so the system is mechanical. My phone has to ring, server's down, what's wrong, and go uh, across the net, tell the other box to come on and connect to the network and life goes on. And then I have to resynchronize the files. Now that's worked for a couple of years, but it's obviously <laughs> not the, the smartest thing around and it causes trouble when when things go wrong. So I've, I've looked at the backup problem, and I, in the next slide I'll show you a little more, but I wanted to, to, to make this thing work, so I, if I back up a second, can I, can I back? Each of these boxes is almost identical. They're full clones. So if a disk drive fails or something of this kind, I simply move to a new box. Everything's ready to run in the shortest amount of time. So that's, that's, they're, they're complete duplicates of things. So I wanted the, the clones for, uh, for things to work. I wanted one IP number that the users saw. That was the only thing they knew about. Uh, local storage in each box. Uh, and then I had to do everything mechanically to switch it over. Uh, and I do have a private link for server-server uh, communications, the rsync stuff and so on. So this, this switchover takes a few minutes once the phone is rung and I've figured out what's going on. But rsync runs every hour and then for every database every three hours. There's a point here that that's sampling the world. And I've gotten into a more complicated situation where I needed to do something else. Uh, <clears throat> so we've got three problems with this manual failover as we do these things. Phone calls, Recovery of unsynced files. We've, we've done our sync, time has progressed, system crashed. There are new files on this server, but they're not on the backup yet because our sync hasn't run again. So we've got to deal with those partial changes. That's not very good. And so the periodic sync means one machine is always behind at times. The next version of this server system will use SUSE's high availability. It's going to be using clustering, again, two machines, local drives. And the, with local drives, I'm going to mirror the drives across the net. Distributed, replicated, disk blocks, DRBD, is part of the high availability suite that keeps two drives in sync in real time. In real time. And then the cluster software decides which machine is carrying the applications today or at any other time, and, and so on. And I built a, a, a second system that uses this, and it's very effective in the field. Uh, the, the SLES HA stuff is really quite good. And so in um, the system I've just shown you with manual switches, in about a week or two, I'm going to go over to Wales and uh, sit down with uh, disk drives and put the high availability stuff on it. Open source, SUSE 11.4 has these components. 
So here's the HA solution. Again, two machines, and the master is on the left in this case, and a slave. On the bottom line is a green. Uh, on the bottom is a green line that connects the two disk drives, a synchronization channel for carrying traffic for this distributed replicated disk block stuff. Uh, there are green lines going up from each of them that are standard IP numbers for management, and and so on. And the users don't know about that IP number at all. So it's for management. And in the middle is a box that says IP number, databases, and applications. Those are the applications that the user sees. And they would be run on either of these two machines. Now, symbolically, I put it into a box, and I put an HA switch beneath the clustering controls. But basically, things run on one box or the other box, but they don't split between them. This is called a failover cluster not a distributed computing environment. I don't move one application to another machine while some run on the first. Everything runs on one or on the other. It's a failover kind of thing. There's an interesting problem with clustering. It's called the split brain condition, where two sides become separated and they begin to evolve independently. And then you'd like to bring them together and they're inconsistent. And how do you merge two separate operations, just like, you know, life in itself, and, and that's, a, that's a bad thing. So to avoid that, uh, people go to techniques called uh, stoneth and so on, which means I think I feel good. I haven't heard from my friend over there, and I'm not certain that he's shut down, so I'm going to force it down. I'm going to send a message to his power strip and kill his machine. And those kinds of very primitive kinds of die, die, there's only one person in charge here. I don't have that problem. And the reason, no, by design, you know, we can be clever instead of brute force. The cluster software runs on each box, and it says, oh, I'll go sample all my little applications periodically and see if they're running or not, and I'll report to the cluster software what the state of the world is. Fine. And then I will also tell the other side how my guys feel. So there's a general view of how things are getting on. The cluster software decides what's going to run where. So that's fine. Well, I have in the green line on the bottom the disk block replication traffic, which is intense, uh, plus cluster sync. So it has a channel to say, hi, I, this is how I feel, how do you feel? On the green lines going up, I also have cluster sync. So I have replicated cluster sync. Double the traffic, but it's all very small. 10 kilobytes a second is, is a large amount. That means I could cut any of those wires any two of those three wires, and the system still knows how the other side feels, and one side is always running. There is no situation I can get into trouble. So I've eliminated the, uh, the split brain condition automatically, and people do disconnect wires. So this has been running for two and a half years now, uh, the first system. Uh, performance has been fine. We've had several outages. On things, how am I doing on time here? I've got a few minutes. Um, and so on, and there's a bit of a flurry when that happens, but no files have been lost. I have a cleanup script that comes along and, and brings things into synchronization. Educating people is, as it says here, is a chore, is, is difficult, because we're dealing with non IT people who have to create users and see what's going on. And that takes years, it's very painful. So whatever we do has to be very, very, very simple and obvious. And that takes thought. Now, I've cloned this system for other customers uh, because I've got the design straight, and that, that's handy so I don't have to work hard on things. Things we don't do. Um, I don't try to manage desktops. That's a favorite game of the um, enterprise is to manage people's desktops. Well, uh, there's no way I can play that game uh, myself. I don't have the time. And people's desktops are not sitting in an office, but people are all over the world, so there's no way I can uh, deal with their individual things. Uh, printer support is another one of these things where people have become uh, very isolated. I have a printer, it's sitting right next to me, and that's, where, that's how I print, rather than the enterprise kind of environment. So I don't worry about printers, they're basically owned by individuals. Repair facility. Uh, we tried it, my machine doesn't work very well today, it's slow, it doesn't work at all. We try to be helpful, 
but in the end, the locals on site are going to have to deal with that. So I pass that off. But I have a way of people reporting that there's trouble, either the phone or through the RT resource ticket kind of kind of situation um, and the like. And we try not to sit on our hands very much here because there's always things that can change. So the question is, how does this thing really measure up uh, in, in the scheme of things? Um, it's not as polished as we would expect from a commercial implementation. The screens don't look as nice and there's a bit clunkiness and so on. Uh, so it's, it's not as pretty. Uh, but the features are very, very similar uh, to things. Uh, it's more flexible and expandable than many commercial solutions. It's open source. We can add, subtract things, we can change things, or rewrite some of the code if necessary to make these things go. Uh, the cost could not be lower is zero <laughs> in these things, uh, except in people time. It does take a lot of skill to make these things go. And of course, the user interfaces could always be better. Uh, the bottom line is, in fact, the bottom line. The development and implementation of all this does take both skill and time. Now, anybody can do it, but it's a question of how long it would take to do it. Uh, because you really do have to think your way through and find out what's reasonable, possible to work to do. And many people get caught by assumptions. Oh, well, assume this without realizing it, and they create a mess. And you can't do that in this kind of thing uh, to make it go. But it's, it is possible to do. So I try to encourage people to have a go at this kind of thing. We end up with more than we thought. And then uh, <laughs> the exploration stuff. This is a famous quotation from Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, there are the known knowns and the, and the known unknowns and then, of course, the unknown unknowns are the things that cause us a great deal of trouble in these things. And that really does represent the kind of situation we get into when we create a complicated, complex situation environment in which to do some very basic services uh, for people over the long run. Uh, it's sort of a fun thing to do, but there we are. And I'm done. Questions, comments? <laughs> Questions? Yeah. So, uh, if someone wants to play with this, to actually see how it works, yeah. uh, is there a TARTZ file that we can download from Zauer or something? Yeah, you raise an important question. Suppose somebody wants to look into this and say, gee, how'd you do that? Maybe I could do something similar or better or whatever it happens to be. I'm of two minds, and I'll tell you my dilemma. My, I'm built to externalize information. I'm a professor, right? I keep pushing things out. You know, more of the people, the more people know, the better kind of thing. So that's one mind. The other mind is I'm trying to run a small business. <laughs> And uh, there's a lot of work I've put into this that I would like to confine things. So, and I'm, and I'm caught. And, and you would be too in the same situation. You, we'd all feel the same way. And where to draw the line? And my answer is my first half dominates. So if you want it, I'll give it to you. I have documentation. I spent a lot of time documenting things and so on. Uh, but I would hope that you wouldn't compete with me <laughs> <laughs> but I would be delighted if you did better. I really would be delighted if you did better. Tear it apart. I, I'm a science person, so you're not attacking me as a person when you say, you know, that's a bunch of rubbish. <laughs> you know, Mario, you can do better than that. You're attacking it, not me, so I don't care. That's fine. Uh, and so on. So I would be happy to. In fact, uh, I was in Orlando uh, a month ago, and... Uh, the question would be, should I take something like this and put it into the archives for SUSE, for OpenSUSE in particular, so other people could see as examples and then you know, do whatever they, they want with it. And I sort of backed away from it because of this two minds kind of thing, and I'm still not entirely decided. Now, you guys can help me decide if you need to on these things. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really quite reasonable about this kind of stuff. It's, my goal was to get this problem solved for people, but also to allow others to build systems by starting you know, with what I have and tearing it apart and doing it better. So it's, it's, that's how civilization works, right? We build on top of other people. So don't know quite what to do.
to be honest. AOQ, any other questions, comments? I declare coffee time. Thank you very much.